Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies, and Trakel has a very generous offer for you Savvy Painter listeners. Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making for over 30 years, and now they're applying that same obsession to their professional grade art panels. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. So Trakel is offering you, the Savvy Painter listeners, an exclusive discount. From now through May 4th, when you use promo code SAVVY20, you get 20% off of your first order. Julian Davis has been painting the American South for over 25 years. How he ended up in Alabama is a very interesting story, which Julian is going to tell you about. But it started with a book on the history of Alabama and a group of Napoleonic exiles who founded a small town called Demopolis. We talk about how he established himself as a painter after immigrating from England. At first, he thought it would be a short stay, but it ended up becoming a permanent move. Julian shares some of his missteps, like making drastic changes in his work without communicating or leading his collectors with them. Now Julian sort of separates painting for himself so that he allows room for experimentation from painting to show and sell. And in this episode, he elaborates on how that shift has helped him. And as I'm sure you're aware, Art communities can be hugely important to an artist's growth and development. Julian and I explore some of the benefits of live versus online gatherings. Julian now lives in Asheville, North Carolina. His newest work, interpreting traditional American ballads through the contemporary South, has been touring museums with accompanying lectures and musical performances. Here is Julian Davis. Julian, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you so much, Antrice. It's a delight to be on this podcast. I want to hear a little bit about kind of your early days when you first started painting. Can you tell me when you made the decision that you were going to dedicate yourself to painting and what that felt like? Yeah, well, I um, really, I think my family were very supportive in me being an artist really from the get-go. I, even by the age of four or five, I was drawing all the time. And I think particularly my mother, who had, she had wanted to go to art school, but had gone to a secretarial school instead in London in the 60s. She was extremely supportive. My father was a writer, but also a barrister, a lawyer. And he felt that it would probably be best if I attended law school first and then did my painting on the side. But my mother was insistent that I would go to art school. So as I say, really from the very, very first, from the age five or six, people referred to me as the, you know, the artist in the family. <laughs> I love it. That's pretty unusual, I think, of your mother to just say, you know, no law school. If you, It sounds like she was sort of the opinion that if you're going to do this, do this. That's right. She was. And I think I'm very grateful she did. It was also in the days when this was back in England, when university education was free. So that was that made a big difference, too. You know, you could you could go to university and I think you could even get a master's for free. Oh, so nice. Argentina's the same way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. such a wonderful thing. So I'm glad she did that. Yeah, it was great. But I had a lot of support, quite an artistic family. So a number of painters in the 19th century, and then a lot of musicians and people in the family. So a lot of support. Oh, interesting. Is that on your, and just out of curiosity, is that on your mom's side? Let's see, the, actually, the, uh, the, the musical side is both. Yeah, my, my grandmother was a great musician, and my aunt, yes, lots of people. Who were some of the artists that you, that you were looking at when you were young, when you were starting to explore your, your artistic sensibilities? I suppose a big influence, think about it. My father was really fascinated by America. So I grew up with that. He, he played a lot of the music. He was a guitarist and he played a lot of American folk music. And of course, there was the movies. So I suppose when I started looking at painting, it would have been Edward Hopper. Uh-huh. And then actually, Andrew, I know a number of your guests have mentioned Andrew Wyeth, but he was, he was a big influence, I think, for a lot of artists in England as well. My grandparents on my mother's side retired early. They had a small boarding school in the southwest of England, and they retired the year I was born. And 
an interesting thing was that they decided to keep that the place. They only had about 40 students, but it was still a big house. But they felt they would uh, stay there. So they just locked up the the wings, like the, the wings of the school, the, uh-huh. the classrooms and the dormitories. And they never they, they left everything in there, you know, the desks and the beds and the, really? the, sort of Harry, the sort of Harry Potter hats and things that the teachers would wear. Uh, and it was all there. And I used to explore it. And so later, when I first started at art school, I would go back there and paint and paint all their sort of these dusty rooms and these sort of broken, plum, you know, broken sinks. And <laughs> and I think definitely Wyeth was a big, big influence. Yeah, definitely. What is it in particular about Wyeth that, that you were so attracted to? Well, I think it, it was the subject matter primarily. We, we certainly have had equivalent painters in England, but I just stumbled on a big book of Wyeth's work. Yes, it was definitely the sort of, rather a sort of non-sentimental view of places that have been sort of left alone or, you know, it's fine. It was definitely sort of the finding beauty in things that are, that a lot of people might find ugly or, you know, unattractive. Right. The kind of mundane, just normal, you're not really into the, uh, (laughs) the sort of picturesque or not, I don't want to say picturesque because that's not, I don't think that's accurate either, but the, the sentimental, bucolic scenes exactly exactly i find it interesting that a lot of critics sort of accuse wyeth of being a sentimentalist because i think very few of his paintings could be described as sentimental Mm. yeah so anyway i think yes that i would say those two and certainly popper and wyeth were probably why i chose to you know when i left art school probably the reason i chose to come to the states really yeah can you elaborate on that well i'd been on a sort of crazy Greyhound bus trip through the American South a couple of years before I left art school. And it was a kind of a disaster because we would, we, my friend and I decided to save money by sleeping on the bus rather than, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, our plan was to catch Greyhound buses in the dead of night uh-huh. and go on to the net, you know, wake up in a new city. And this was in the early eighties and there was a lot of crime and so we found ourselves, you know, based on our crazy plan, just, you know, in all these downtowns like Detroit and Nashville and New Orleans, and there was a lot of crime. And we'd be out there at one o'clock in the morning trying to find the bus station. And, you know, right. And sort of by default, bus stations are, are not usually located in the best of neighborhoods. Yeah, they're you terrible know, they're kind of outside. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So that was so I'd, I'd, I was intrigued by that. And I, I'd always loved the literature and the music of the South. So when I finished art school, I decided to go on a trip. A lot of people in England do a gap year, you know, mm-hmm. between between high school and university. And my, my niece is doing that at the moment. But I, I waited, obviously, until right after art school. And I thought, I'll just go to America for a few months. And I decided, I'd, I'd picked up an old book on the history of Alabama. And there was a chapter in there on a town called Demopolis that was settled by Napoleonic exiles. I've never heard of Demopolis. That's a great name, though. It's a great name, and very few people, even in Alabama, know about that that story. Yeah, so I again, I, I couldn't drive. <laughs> I really waited a long time to learn to drive. But, uh, so I, again, I got the Greyhound bus. I went to New York, first of all, to the public library, and then to the Library of Congress, and got the bus again, and ended up in Alabama, and I just loved the sort of falling down architecture and the, you know, I, I met a very good friend in Greensboro, Alabama, uh-huh. which is uh, very close to Demopolis. And it's where Walker Evans and James Agee had been in the 30s, the WPA. Uh-huh. So there was, a, there was a wonderful history there anyway, of photography particularly. So, yeah, I just, I just definitely found, I found my subject yeah. you know, in, in America. Yeah. Did you, am I understanding this correctly, that you set out for Demopolis? I did. That was the plan, yes. I originally, to be honest, I thought I was going to write some sort of interesting novel. I thought probably, you know, thinking about my dad. My dad's novels were historical fiction. So I think that was probably my starting point, which is probably explain why I researched it in a sort of amateurish way at the Library of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> it's that sort of... It's like playing. I'm just of, trying to imagine this. You just graduate from art school and yeah. then you you decide you're going to take this time to travel around. And I can see why just 
the little bit that you've told me about the story of Demopolis, why that would be int- aside just from the name, because <laughs> yes. the name would pique my the name alone would pique my interest. But that story of the Napoleonic exiles. Yeah, no, it was a bizarre, bizarre history because they were they were thrown out of France when Napoleon was defeated, and they came. They bought land in Philadelphia. They came to Philadelphia, bought land that was in Alabama, and they went down there and tried to hack their way through this endless sort of native bamboo to grow grapes and olives. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it was just a fiasco. It's sort of like <laughs> a, like... it, it sort of, yeah. It was like Inspector Clouseau, you know, trying to farm because they were all general. They were general, you know, the aristocracy and generals, and so they they had. <laughs> I, I, there was one account of 50, 50 of them pulling over a tree. They were cutting a tree down, and they pulled it onto themselves, and, <laughs> and te- 10 of them were killed. Yeah. Oh, my I mean, God. Uh, yeah, amazing. So I, it just struck me as very intriguing, you know, and as I say, I was I was really just playing this role. I, me- I remember before my trip, I, I found this fantastic old leather suitcase from the 1930s, and it had these amazing – labels from hotels in Eastern Europe that are sort of uh-huh. banished and old shipping lines, like, you know, and, and so that's what I took and you could fit nothing. This thing weighed about 20 pounds empty, you know, right, right. <laughs> you, you could fit nothing into it at all. Right. It's over constructed and yeah. 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 <clears throat> oh, so that's, that's, that's uh, I, I'm a romantic at heart. So I, I thought <laughs> I, was, I was trying to be a sort of Indiana Jones of the art world. Yeah. Anyway. I'm, I'm picturing that. That's exactly what I'm picturing. Yeah. And how did you get from there? I mean, I know you went to art school, but it, but um, it sounds like what drives you or what drove you, at least at that time, is the arts in general. Like you've got this very literature background history and mm-hmm. i'm gathering from the story the mention of your family being very much into the arts that you've got these musicians and poets like how did all of that contribute to like i'm really curious how you go from okay i'm gonna take a gap year and check out demopolis <laughs> and, then, and then you end up staying here and settling roots and and painting what was the transition I came to Tuscaloosa and I was fascinated by the story and uh, I fell in love and uh, I basically decided that America was going to be the place for me to be an artist. So that was a, it was a very fortunate trip to have taken because, yeah. because I, I found, you know, I grew up in a part of England that is extremely beautiful in Bath, which is you know, mm-hmm. a very elegant, elegant town. And Obviously, it's, it wasn't my thing to paint things that are evidently beautiful. I'm right. definitely drawn to things that, I don't know, a bit more challenging, I suppose. So the South was great because it, it provided me all of that. And it, it did also have a lot of natural beauty that I was very happy to paint. And that was very helpful for me making a living. Right, right. Was that difficult for you to leave behind? You know, I mean, I, I'm just... I had this experience where I, you know, like I moved away, not really knowing how long I was going to be gone and ended up, you know, I think when I left the States for Argentina, in my head, I was only going to be gone for six months. And it was six years. At a certain point, you know, I'm like, wow, that was six years. Okay. Yeah. But I'm just kind of curious, like, if you made the decision to move or if you're like me, where it's just like, "Mm, I'll just stay a couple more months. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wow, was it difficult? I, yeah, that's a very good question. I never thought I would be here forever. Each year sort of just seemed to open. My choices seemed, you know, I, I didn't close myself up to, to what was going to happen. Uh, what I did notice, though, was after about 10 or 15 years, England had changed so much, as, you know, often happens to people who are, you know, immigrants or... Mm-hmm. Yeah, England, as, and maybe that's why I have a, a sympathy. You know, I'm now painting that Demopolis series, actually, and maybe that's why I have a certain sympathy for those people who are sort of exiles or refugees is that, you know, I find myself in this place that I didn't intend yeah. to be living. But uh, no, I, I never really thought it was going to be a permanent thing. But England now is not the England I remember, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sure part of that is because England has changed, but at the same time, you're changing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, Interesting. so that, that's a common situation. For, it is. Uh, for people who move abroad. 
Yeah. It is. It's very common. And it's also so interesting to sort of have the reverse culture because you're no longer from either. You're not from here. Right. But you're kind of no longer from there either. Like Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, only, the only consolation to that is being an artist. I think one always feels something of an outsider. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's never bothered me to be to be one step removed from you know whatever situation I'm in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, you stand off to one side and you can observe. Yeah, I'm curious also when you you know started getting settled and you know like at, at a certain point you you must have thought okay I'm going to be here for at least a little while. Like if you're like me, it's like okay for the next six months or for X amount of time. When you made that decision that this was no longer going to be a gap year, how did you go about establishing yourself as an artist? Well, that was a very interesting thing because having come from England, you know, England has quite a, a substantial sort of safety net. And the one thing I realized in Alabama is, you know, it, there was no question of, you know, that really relying on anything like that. Uh, the, I didn't feel I wasn't in a position and I'm not really that keen on grants and things. So. Mm-hmm. So it really was, I very quickly had to sort of pull myself together and work out how I could make a living. And I think I was just really fortunate because I was very interested in landscape painting and the fact that I loved doing landscape and that I wanted to teach myself all the techniques of landscape painting. That was extremely helpful because I I, I slowly, I started very much as a sort of a realist painter, very traditional. Mm-hmm. Painter, and that certainly suited the tastes of the art buying public where I was living. At that time, I was in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm-hmm. So that was great. And very slow, I learned uh, another thing, which was to very slowly sort of introduce work that I was doing, like the sort of the more Hopper esque mm. paintings, to not try and do that from the very start. You know, I would have a few in, in a show. It, I noticed, and I've learned that over the years, that it takes a couple of years for people to get used to transitions you make as an artist. Yes. So I've always found that's the thing. is you, What you want to do is sort of build a following, and then as you experiment and evolve, just be prepared that the people who want to follow that work, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a couple of years. I think that happened to me with... With my paintings, uh, sort of architectural paintings of the south, of the rundown south, that took it two or three years, and I was sort of recognized for that. And then the same thing happened with the interiors, mm-hmm. and more recently with the narrative paintings. It just, mm-hmm. I've just, it, you know, I've just learned to give people time. The one sort of calamitous financial decision I made probably 10 or 12 years ago was to become impatient and change style drastically you know i had a a big solo show coming up and i changed the style and worse than that i i think i probably gave the impression that the new work was better than the old work so you insulted your former collectors yes yeah exactly (laughs) yeah it's the sort of it's the dylan going electric uh, syndrome it's not, (laughs) not not a good idea so yes one has to Go gently, you know. Yeah, you you lead them lead them along with you instead of just like taking a hard right and hitting the gas and leaving them in the dust, wondering what just happened. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's a it's a great lesson to learn. Yeah, so that's I still now I I'm very happy doing the landscapes and I'll take probably half of each day just doing that sort of work and then I I really do think of the other work I do as. It's very much myself. It's very important for me to communicate, but I I realized something pretty important, particularly with the narrative painting, Mm -hmm. which is that the difference between speaking to people in your art and selling your art, they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can make art to show without absolutely having to sell. Yeah, I'd love for you to elaborate a little bit on that, because I this is a, a topic that I know makes artists nervous and scared and also simultaneously frustrates and annoys them that, you know, you want to be able to work on the things that interest you and experiment and have these transition periods for yourself as an artist. 
And yet, at the same time, you have to, like you said, you have to kind of lead people in that. You can't just make a, an abrupt, drastic well, you can, but there's consequences to making an abrupt, drastic change. So I'm kind of curious on your on your day to day, how are you managing it? Because it sounds like you've got another body of work sort of in the wings that you're playing with. Am I hearing that correctly? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So what I do is I, I'll basically, I, I think, here's another thing too. I mean, I, I do, you know, I spend 10 hours a day in the studio and you can't really work full out on very intellectually demanding work for that period of time. Mm-hmm. So what I, I sort of realized early on is the best thing is to be able to be in the studio all the time. If you supplement your income, at least for me, if you supplement it by having to go away from the studio, let's say some people say, oh, I'll do some framing, you know, I'll work in a frame shop or I'll do some teaching or workshops or whatever. To me, or I will say, I mean, teaching is, you know, teaching workshops and things can be very uh, rewarding. But no, to me, it's if, if you can be in the studio all the time, that's how to be most productive. And so I literally, I really would though. I, initially, I'd do these sort of very you know, traditional landscapes and I'd have all these bits of luon bits of old bits of wood and things and i would just spend three or four hours a day just totally experimenting and the things i liked i would as i say i would sort of slowly infiltrate them into shows just mm-hmm. to see how people responded and yeah it was that to me is, was a real sort of breakthrough how did you set yourself up for that though so like because it is very common for artists to have a sideline and then have their their studio painting or their you know like their actual painting time from what i see doing all these interviews it's it feels like i've actually never run the numbers but you know just off the top of my head i would say that it's probably about 90% of the artists have something else going on even you know if it is as parallel as teaching would be So how did you set yourself up for the situation where you feel, well, I guess like, I guess describe that to me, like how that happened. That's a very good question. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it, but I suppose what it comes down to is that when you, when you paint something that's meant to sell, when you paint something that is going to pay the bills, you have to be, to use your term, you have to be very savvy. You just don't paint anything that's boring. Mm -hmm. When you do that work, that's the work that needs to sell. So in that sense, you have to be a sort of commercially minded as someone like Turner, you know, some of those artists, it's, you pick your subjects very carefully. And yeah, you, you need that work to be extremely sellable. And so that's, I know it sounds very simplistic, but that's how I divided it. So that the, the work that was experimental could be as experimental, you know, I could, I could, I was able, I had time every day to do things that, that would not succeed you know that could fail that i could paint over Mm -hmm. so um i know i know that sounds rather simple i mean as i say it was very fortunate for me that i love landscape Um, i mean that's been a great fallback situation for me but it it is definitely a question of making that extra effort i found for example that you know especially when i moved to north carolina to the mountains it was worth getting out there first thing in the morning, if there were any interesting effects of weather, mm-hmm. all those sort of things, just to really make that stuff as unique as possible. I'm curious too that if this played into it at all, but I'm curious, a couple of things struck me as you've, as you've been talking. I, I understand going to Alabama for, because you were curious about this, this little town and, and ending up sort of establishing yourself there a little bit, but if I look at it in terms of if I'm going to leave my country to, you know, I'm an artist, I've studied art, I'm leaving my country to explore my painting. And maybe you didn't intend that at all. And so maybe that's the answer to my question. But no offense to Alabama, I would have thought of places like New York, or like, I don't think I would have thought like, I'm going to go to Alabama. Well, you know, that's a, yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, because this is a question that, that pops up often, how important do you think location is? And was there a point where you're like, I'm in Alabama, perhaps I should move along or? Ah, very good point. Very good point. Yes. I'm glad I did that because, because I 
found a lot of places and I still go back, you know, I still have paintings that relate to that mm -hmm. and to you know, other, I just went through Louisiana and parts of South Georgia and, you know, so I still paint the deep South, but that's very true. I, it, it was, I'm learning particularly in the last few years, how fantastic, you know, the environment is for painters in places like say New York or Philadelphia and, and that's, I didn't realize when I was putting myself in the middle of nowhere that I was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, and I, this is why I appreciate your podcast so much and, and all these sort of things, because, you know, and I've also, this is on the matter of, you know, I, I think you had said something about talking about the community yes. of art artists. Yes. And I think that's very interesting to me because I think what's happening now with the, the artistic community is that at the widest level, the more sort of international and national level, that social media has been fantastic for getting people together. Yes. Who, who wouldn't know about each other. But what I, the only thing that concerns me is that social media also has so many people with their heads in their phones that it's quite hard to see people who live next door. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And to give yourself time for thoughts and ideas to percolate, for lack of a better term. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mentioned on your Facebook page, you know, I had this huge dining table and I used to organize these dinner parties where. Oh, yes. Not dinner parties. That's the wrong. That sounds far too fancy. Uh, big suppers. And I realized that a lot of other people didn't even have dining tables. So I got used to the fact that it was, you know, I was going to be the perpetual host, uh -huh. you know, and I even had a, had a big sort of tipping jar so I could buy the food. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I've got to say that that local community has diminished more and more. And I think that's because of Facebook and social media. I think people are getting just enough of a fix talking to other people through social media that they don't have a need to get together, you know, around a table. Interesting. Yeah. And that's a shame to me, because I think that's when you can get some fantastic ideas. It, it is. And you're just making me think of, you know, we have some really good friends here. They actually don't live here. They come to visit often and we just randomly met them. But now we're constantly over the, at their house for dinner when they come up here. And right. it is the most fascinating mix of literal rocket scientists, intellectuals, artists, musicians, etc., that all seem to find their way to their table. Mm -hmm. And I meet people and have discussions that there's, there's no way I would not have it without that environment yes. where you're seated at a table face to face when you're going to these dinners often enough, you see one or two familiar faces, but there's also a constant change in who's there. Yeah, absolutely. Which is really something that I think intellectually is, is very intellectually stimulating and also allows you to hear this particular group of people. They're Bulgarian. And so there's often people from Bulgaria or, you know, like all over the world. And then also, somehow, well, not somehow, it's it's definitely through their work, but we're talking to inventors and rocket scientists and artists and people, you know, like a cellist that plays for the Philharmonic, and they all come together here. And so it makes for such diverse, fascinating conversations that leave you afterwards kind of still thinking for a day or two afterwards. It's exactly, absolutely. I, mean, I think for people like us who are self-employed, you know, artists, there are no deadlines. The best deadline in the world is knowing that you're going to see people uh -huh. and be able to talk about what you've done that day. Yeah. So I'm hoping, you know, I'm just trying to make an effort. But yes, I'd like to get that back. I, I've, I look at, you know, what seems to be going on in places like, like I say, like Philadelphia, and it seems so energized up there. Amazing. Yeah. 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 There are certain hotbeds. And I think that that you know, sometimes comes from, you know, the university, just that sort right. of brings it or, or you yeah. know, college or university, those towns typically have that more. But then also, like, sometimes, yeah, you just have to go out and, and make it happen. <laughs> I, I do. I know. <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, that's one reason I go on these giant road trips, you know, to I pick some strange historical fact, but I'm also going to see people who are good friends, you know, because it's easier for me to turn up <laughs> or for right. them to come and see me. It's easier to have to sit around a table if we do that than not. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is 
something that I think people are are losing is just the and maybe I'm more I notice it more because of, you know, in Argentina at least it's very common for people to just drop by and Absolutely. Yeah, and dinners are just as much about getting there in time to help chop the vegetables and cook as it is like the conversation that happens for four hours after dinner. So the actual eating of dinner, like I think in the U S we sort of have this habit where like dinner is served at seven o'clock and you know, it goes until yeah. eight or nine. And then after that, yeah. everybody's like, Oh, got to work, go home. Whereas, and maybe that's why we have such an affinity for this, this couple that, that we met that they Bulgarian lifestyle seems to be very similar to Argentina and that it's it's like a six hour event and it's yeah fun <laughs> it's it's uh, I know I grew up absolutely with that and I I know I will never stop missing it so uh, as I say I'm trying to do my best to recreate it but it's not easy but yeah it's a wonderful wonderful way to interact with people you know yeah I wonder yeah I mean maybe this podcast is like a very, not the same thing, but some online version of it in a way. I'm wondering if there's other ways to encourage and promote that, even if you can't get around the table. It is because, you know, when, when I listen to your podcast, it's listening to a, an, another artist for, you know, a good hour, an hour plus, And it's, it's terrific. Yeah. You, it's fantastic. You get to hear their voice. You know, you don't just, you don't see an image that they've posted Right. On Instagram, you actually hear their voice and, you know, who they are. And it's wonderful. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. For over 30 years, Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making. Trakel sells directly to artists, and they do that so they can keep their quality high and their costs low. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. Brian Trakel is the founder of Trakel Art Supplies. I asked him what he recommends artists do to keep their brushes longer. Well, probably one of the most funny things is when people find out I'm a brush maker, they'll pull up some Grumbacher brush that they've had for 30 years, and it's worn down to another, and they say this is the greatest thing they have, and they're still using it. I always get a kick out of that, but if you want to make a brush last, you just, you've got to take care of it, and that means you've got to clean it. And quite often, that's where people have trouble, is that they just don't clean it well enough, and it builds up, and it destroys the filament, so it makes it push out, and it just makes it work improperly. If they want them to last forever and ever and ever, take really good care of them. But depending on the, what you're painting on, it's going to wear out the brush. That's another thing is that people need to be able to recognize that the brush has the, its useful life and it's time to get another one. You're going to notice at some point in time that it's just not giving you the result you, you think you should be getting out of it. So is it time to replace your brushes? If it is, right now is a great time to do it because Turkel is giving you a very, very generous offer. When you go to turkel.com and you enter the code SAVVY20, that's S-A-V-V-Y-2-0, into the promotional code at checkout, you get 20% off of your entire order. That's so fantastic. But act now because this offer is only good until May 4th. I'd love to hear, you know, because you, you started talking about this. And so I want to go back to tell me about your sort of typical day in the studio. Right. Well, yes, my typical day. It's funny. I was just the New York Times just had a thing on daily routines. And I was just I was actually thinking, what is my daily routine? But yeah, so no, I basically I get up and read for a while. And I watch the birds at the bird feeder. <laughs> <laughs> and then. I, I go into the studio at about eight o'clock and I have a good friend who comes by. She, she's a sort of part time student and her grandkids are good friends with my little boy. So she'll come by uh, a couple of mornings a week and we'll chat. You know, I, it's just really she works on her thing and I would chit chat. And then after lunch, I will work on whatever, you know new project I'm working on. At the moment, those are all the narrative mm -hmm. series. So there's three or four of those going on at the moment. I have a, a nice big studio. I think Asheville is very reasonable in terms of rent, well, parts of Asheville. Mm -hmm. And so I have a very large studio so I can store that work that I do, which I, I consider, as I say, I always consider the sort of the work I do 
sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the afternoon, but it's, it's the work I consider that I do for myself. And I'm able to store all that. It's it's odd that now, when I, as, as I say, when I used to experiment, everything I did that was tiny, uh, w- that I did for myself was little tiny bits of wood and so on. Mm-hmm. And now, now the work I sell is generally smaller, and these narrative things are enormous. <laughs> so people, people think I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll post something and, and they'll say, well, where's that going? And I, I'll say, no effort now, it's for me, you know. So I've got this <laughs> huge <laughs> sort of four and five foot square paintings, this giant, giant things. But I do paint those for different museum shows. So they do get, which is very important, you know. I wouldn't, it's, inter- it's actually an interesting sideline. I was going to talk about that, about communicating. A friend of mine, an artist here in Asheville, a few years ago, asked, asked people, would they paint anything if nobody was going to see it? Uh-huh. Which is a really interesting question. And, and the, you know, the people were divided. I think a lot of people, a sort of knee-jerk reaction said, oh, absolutely, you know. Right. But for me, I said, no, I don't think I said, if no one could ever see the work, I said, no, I think I would just switch to writing, assuming I could, you know, that that's part of this speculative idea of his. That's a that's a great dinner party question. So (laughs) so is it is it like if no one ever saw your work at all or is it that particular body? Yes. If no one ever saw it. Ever. So nobody ever sees your painting whatsoever. That's a really good, because the, in, the instinct is. Yes, there's a sort of artistic, political, correct way, which is the sort of way of art being therapy and. A growth practice. Yeah, mm-hmm. a growth thing, a sort of th- a therapeutic process, you know. But he and I both agreed that, you know, if that was the case, that we'd just stop because it. There's no feedback. There's no feedback. And I think it comes from that same thing you get when you're a kid and you draw something mm-hmm. and you bring it into your parents it's that sort of dopamine it's, it's of course actually what uh, social media works on it's a little dopamine hit mm-hmm. uh, you know yeah, <laughs> the kid exactly. shows the drawing it gets put up on the fridge and I think us artists were the ones who showed enough talent that our peers started saying hey that's cool yeah we just said well that's what we're going to do then you know this is great I'm just going to keep making art. <laughs> yeah, it's a what? It's not. It's a two-way thing, art. It is. It is. It's like I mean, there are some people that in, really enjoy having a monologue, but you can't sustain that without kind of going crazy. <laughs> I think exactly, exactly. And, and there's exactly what you just said. That was what I was starting. What I was thinking about because if it's if it's a, if it's a short amount of time, or if there's a body of work that absolutely nobody will under any circumstances will ever (laughs) see it. You have this twilight zone thing where, you know, like that just never is impossible to happen even after Mm. you're gone. I think I would be okay with that as long as I was still being able to paint, you know, take those lessons and paint something else. But if like hands down, nobody ever, ever, ever sees your work. Yeah. That's really interesting because your impulse is that, Hey, look what I did. Yes, it is. I mean, it's a very evangelical thing. I mean, like I say, particularly with these these narrative things, I, I it's a weird sort of chip on my shoulder, you know. And I, I was a sort of weird kid because my <laughs> my grand I had a grandfather who was actually in the First World War. Uh huh. So he he had my father when he was much older, a much older parent. And on my mother's side, my grandfather was a historian. So I I grew up with this very big expanse of history, you know, yeah. of cu- cultural history. So sort of 30s music and folk music and blues and you know, the whole history, you know, this big gamut. Mm-hmm. So I, in the later in life, I appreciated what Tom Waits, Tom Waits said mm-hmm. something about how he was always old mm-hmm. and he, or, or, or how he was looking forward to being old. And <laughs> I think there was a part of me, you know, when I was sort of reading Sherlock Holmes and, Ryder Haggard and all these writers from the 1890s. And, right. You know, I mean, I, I grew up, yeah, thinking it would be so good to be old. And just be able to sit there and, <laughs> yeah. and smoke your pipe and, and yes, read exactly. in front of the fire. It's, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so anyway, to get, sorry, to, uh, to get back to what I think. So because I liked all this stuff through high school and then at, uh, in art school, people thought I was a bit, you know, a bit weird. And they said, well, you know, what on earth are you, why are you interested in this, this music or why are you painting paintings based on old sea shanties and 
ballads and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just, I've just maintained this conviction that if I keep doing it, they'll get the point. They'll see why this old folklore is like shockingly relevant to everything that happens now. You know, yeah. that's why I'm doing the murder ballads to me that that series based on Appalachian ballads that to me, I, I read Malcolm Gladwell book and he was talking about the culture of honor in the South and, you know, America's sort of weird relationship to violence. Mm -hmm. And so that stuff to me is just, it seems incredibly pertinent. And as I say, I'm pretty evangelical about it. So for people who are hearing this and just to put it into context, can you describe the murder ballads for people? Yes. Well, I, like I say, I, I'd done paintings on and off that were sort of narrative, that particularly in, in art school. And then I really switched to painting from observation, you know, particularly, as I said, the landscape and then interiors. But I came back to what happened actually was a, a museum in South Carolina bought a big interior of mine. And I was, I was talking to the uh, director and the subject came up that I was working on these ballad paintings. And he said he'd be interested in giving me a show Mm -hmm. And so that that was fantastic, you know. So I I did the very large paintings for that, and that just sort of got me hooked back into narrative painting and sort of large scale narrative painting. Mm -hmm. So what I what I would do is take these old ballads. A lot of them came from the Scottish borders, mm -hmm. came over to the Appalachians. So what I would do is just update those songs and place them in sort of trailer parks and. <sighs> In that part of the South, because people are still living out those stories, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to say it's it's actually, it's it's getting a fun. I think the art world is still completely flummoxed by it. It's been popular in with museums that have a very, uh, have rather sort of distinct directors, you know, people mm -hmm. in, in the South who like things that are quirky. Definitely appeals more to people with a bias towards history and literature, I think. With uh, a bias towards history and literature. Yeah, yeah, in the art, those those people in the art world, the, the people in the art world who are much more image driven, to them, it's just too odd. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But those ballads, have, they've been around several museums. And I think I'm talking to the, uh, there's a festival in Knoxville, mm -hmm. called the Big Ears Festival. That's a sort of a weird music festival. I've got some fantastic musicians coming over from all over the world, actually next week. And they're actually interested in doing a, because what I do is I hang all the paintings and then I give a talk about the history. And then I have mm -hmm. musicians who are, inter, there's quite a few of them around Asheville who are internationally known mm -hmm. for singing these old ballads, mm -hmm. which they have learned through several generations. You know, these their ancestors came over here, you know, Scots, Irish, and, and they have maintained these songs. So they will perform the songs with the paintings, which is great. Oh my God, that must be amazing. Yeah. Have you read Neil Gaiman, The American Gods? I haven't, no. You might really like that. It reminds right? me in some strange way of what you're, what you're doing. But the quick premise of his book is it's a, you know, it is that sort of historic based science fiction, I guess, is how you would describe Neil Gaiman or Gaiman. Right. But the, the premise is basically like as people immigrated to the United States unknowingly, they brought their physical, literal gods with them. Mm, interesting. And the gods have been just sort of waiting for someone to believe in them again. Ah, yeah. And so they've kept themselves alive. They, it was easy to keep themselves alive in the beginning because people maintained their rituals and their quote unquote superstitions, and that kept them strong and alive. But as right. time has progressed and has, as people have stopped believing in, these gods, they have kind of went underground. Right. And the whole entire story is based on that. And then the sort of conflict, I guess, and you know, every story must have a conflict, is the internet and what that has done to people's thought process and what they believe or don't believe in. Right. So I'm telling you all about the book without giving it away. Excellent. Right. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Sounds I will check it out. Sounds I think great. It would be fascinating giving yeah. what this with these ballads. Yeah, sounds terrific. Yeah. Very cool. So I'm sorry to interrupt you Interrupt you with, with that, but that just reminded me of it. I was, what was I do, doing my daily routine. Mm -hmm. That was it, yeah. So, so yes, <laughs> that's basically, at some point I spend those hours experimenting and, and 
doing weirdo and weirder paintings. Uh-huh. And then then I go for a, a walk or a run out in the out in the woods. And then I come back and do a bit more work. And uh, yeah, that's it, really. I sort of wrap up about seven o'clock, maybe 7.30 in the evening, which is also, as you could tell, I have those European eating habits. So I tend to eat supper late. Yes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm on the fence with that much too. Like I think in the summer, I'm more likely to eat like at nine o'clock or, you know, seven, eight, which, you know, delights my husband because when right. five o'clock is just a ridiculous time, five to 6 p.m. is just absolutely way too early to even consider eating dinner. And so it's a it's a definite culture thing between yes. us of what time yes. we eat dinner. <laughs> yes. yeah. It's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. You know, since we were just talking about books, I'm curious, is there a book that you would recommend? Is there a book that you often recommend to people? What would you recommend to people who are listening? Yes. A great book is one by Ben Shahn, the painter. He gave a series of lectures at Harvard in the 50s, and they're collected in a book called The Shape of Content. Huh. I don't know this book. That's great. Yeah. He's one of those very feist. uh, What I love about especially sort of mid-century American painters, they're they're wonderfully down to earth, you know, feisty people. Mm -hmm. They've got that sort of like like people like Robert Henry earlier and John Marin. Yeah. And Winslow Homer, just incredibly down to earth, you know, no fooling around, talking about painting and very inspiring. They're, They're wonderful. So... That's a great little book of essays. I will have to pick that up. And I also want to know, if you could own a piece of art by any living artist, what would it be or whose would it be? I haven't asked this question. It feels to me like I haven't asked this question in a long time, so you're getting it. Oh, that's a really, in- it's a really interesting question. And I have to ask you, does it count? I thought about this last week. Does it count if they died last week? <laughs> 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 because when I when I said, oh, that that's the piece of art I would like, uh, the next day I found out the poor chap had died. You jinxed him. I did, <laughs> yes. So the, I, a painting I would like is by the English painter Howard Hodgkin. Mm. So Howard Hodgkin, who is an abstract painter, actually. Mm-hmm. And there's a painting, I think there's one called Waking Up in Naples and I think that would be a, a lovely painting to have. One of the things that's funny, when when I do give a demo or something like that, people are always very confused by the artists I cite as being inspirational to me. Mm-hmm. I think they're expecting, as a, well, they probably expect someone like Andrew Wyeth, mm-hmm. but I will bring up people like Bonnar and also Howard Hodgkin. And then I, sometimes if, if a book's accessible or whatever, they'll, they'll, they'll be dragged out and they'll look at the pictures and they'll – kind of, you know, do a double take, <laughs> look, at, look at me and and say, really? You know, and, uh, but uh, do you know uh, Howard Hodgkin's work? I know some of it. I don't know the, the piece that yeah. you're talking about in particular. So why that piece? Well, what I like about Hodgkin is that he came up with a, he was a huge fan of Matisse uh-huh. and Bonnard. And he came up with this very simple idea, which is to to paint intimate abstract paintings. So he would do these pretty small paintings on board. He often would incorporate the the frame. And it would take him years to do them. And he he gave himself a very limited number of brush strokes, ways of applying the paint. I'm not a big fan about limiting oneself, but that was what he chose to do. Mm -hmm. But his paintings are sort of, there's just such a luscious application of paint and just the, the colors and the brush strokes alone, when you see them, they just make you want to push paint around. And another thing for me, whenever I look at a Howard Hodgkin or a Matisse or a Bonnard, <laughs> I always think, oh, I wish you'd just finished that bit. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. There's always some bit. I think, ah, oh, why didn't you, could you just, you know, have done that, you know? And that's just gives me this incredible energy to be painting. You know? And do you ever do you ever see that and then say that to yourself and later on understand why they didn't? Yes, I, I do understand why they didn't. It's just it's just that part of me that's sort of responding, you know. Mm-hmm. So with, with Bonnar, it's all so fluffy and tentative. Uh-huh. And you just you just think, you know, could you just do something that's, you know, 
with obvious conviction or yeah, like, yeah, yeah, real, yeah, just something almost an ugly mark or you know, and and of course he actually he did do that, but you know, there were just all these painters for me. Matisse is the same. It's sort of, and I always end up saying to those students, you know, they'll look at it and they say, well. I can't even often find an example of what I'm talking about when I refer to those artists. I look through the book and it's like, ah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I eventually say, well, it's just, it's the idea of Bonnard's work or Howard Hodgkin's work. I had a funny thing actually in London. I was delivering some paintings to a gallery. This was 20 years ago. And I got these beautiful little English, this guy in Bristol made these little hand built frames that were. You'd never see anything like this, certainly not not in the south, perhaps in the northeast, but they were sort of a French grey with the gold leaf mm-hmm. around the edge. There was very like actually the frames that Mirandi's work was framed in in the 50s mm-hmm. for his big museum show. Anyway, so this guy, I'm in the middle of London and I'm trying to put all these coins into a meter <laughs> and it's like something out of the, you know, the twilight zone. It's like, you know, can you, will you ever get to the point where there's enough coins in this meter? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, I was just thinking, how many pounds have I put into this thing, you know, for 10 minutes or whatever. And this man comes over and he said, oh, those are lovely frames. Can I see? And he, and he, uh, you know, looked through them and off he went. And I, I turned around to the person and I said, that was Howard Hodgkin. That was Sir Howard Hodgkin. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was just tickle pink. Did you, were you so focused on the, on putting your coins in that you, you did, is it one of those things where it took you a few minutes for it to register? Yes, what just it, happened? It just didn't okay. register. You know, yeah, he yeah, rushed yeah. off. Yeah. You want to chase him down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he would have known. He, he's a, he was a big guy on French. He he was a great expert on Indian painting, and he was someone who turned me on to the painting of India. Oh, in interesting. Terms of color and things, yeah, yeah. That sort of makes sense. I didn't know that about him either. Last question before I let you go. Can you describe a single habit that you strongly believe contributes to your growth or your success as an artist? Well, uh, one thing would be, well, first of all, I'm certainly a creature of habit. That, that helps. I, oh. I tend to turn up early for everything and you know i like to have a very organized day everything's down to the minute because there aren't any deadlines because it's all we live in this sort of shapeless world so i like to have these sort of you know oh yes invented deadlines (laughs) yes but i i would say one thing i learned fairly recently i used to try and sort of constantly educate myself particularly with things that did not come naturally to me Mm mm-hmm like, give me an example. Well, like learning to, uh, try, trying to learn French, for example. <laughs> you know, I spent, I did French all through school. And yeah, I, I've always, I'm listening to French radio. and I finally gave up on that. I had this sort of moment of realization where I was listening to several French singers on YouTube. And I mm-hmm. realized that I just didn't understand. Not a single word. <laughs> Not one word. And then I started realizing that I don't actually, when people are singing, I don't understand a lot. Even in English, you mean? Yes. I mean, it's like grunge music or anything. I'm the the guy who just doesn't, you know, I just have no idea what they just said. I like the tune, Mm -hmm. you know, but I don't know what most people singing in English are saying. So I thought, well, you've not got an ear for that. So, you know, perhaps you should just give it a rest, you know. So I think a good habit is that I now... I read very intensely in in those things that I've realized I remember. If I read something and I don't like, say, um, a Hawking book, Mm -hmm. I tried that. (laughs) (laughs) It was a a little tough read. (laughs) Very tough, very tough. So if I can't remember a single thing. That's a horrible feeling when you've just read a chapter and then you realize I I don't know what just happened. I know, I know. I, remember, I, got, I used to get all those great courses back when they had tapes. I have piles, like, you know, rooms full of the great courses thing. And I, I know I just, I'd be listening to something like the history of Jewish intellectual thought, you know, and and they'd say something like talking about, say, Baruch Spinoza. Uh-huh. And I'd just say, Baruch, 
Baruch. And I'll just be just going over that word for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> I like the way that sounds. Yeah, I like the way that sounds. And it all just gone in one out, ear and out the other. So, <laughs> I think that's usually when you're distracted, though. Like, it's yeah. not that you're incapable of understanding. It's just that you're not no, focused on true. what you're doing. That's right. So, so my thing is to play to one's strengths. You know, know your strengths and know your limitations. And yeah, so I, I, that's the sort of thing. You know, if I if I can remember anything, then I'll continue reading and educating myself in that. And, and by doing that, what's interesting is that all of that seems to feed into my art. Mm, yes. It's all grist to that mill. Whereas if I try and teach myself geology, first of all, I'm probably not going to remember it. Uh-huh. Yeah. So so I I still, you know, try and educate myself as broadly as possible, but I'm, I'm learning to focus a little bit more as I get older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And and often there's like, you know, you, you go on a thread and you get fascinated by something which sparks an interest in geology, for example. Whereas if you just were learning geology for the sake of learning geology, you might not follow yes. it. But yes. sometimes yeah. something else will make you have to know all about how rocks are formed. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would say one bit of advice to your listeners too is this is probably not news to them, but I I really believe that an artist has to promote themselves. Yes. That's been a mistake to rely on other people to promote oneself. You know, it, you are your best advocate for your, for your own work. And in that respect, I think technology has helped a lot. Yeah. The technology is there. It's easier than ever. And yet, yes, I think a lot of people are still very reluctant to do it because the most common reason I hear is they don't want to be braggy or arrogant. Well, I know this is this is it. It's uh, it's a sad thing because you know the, the very short period of time where the galleries existed, it's sort of 150 years. It it was incredibly wonderful for all those artists who were, were more self-effacing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, before then, if you were an artist, you had to behave like Bernini or you know Caravaggio. You know, you had to be a real go-getter. Uh huh. The gallery gave us all this wonderful break. And it's a bit of a shock to the system to realize that, you know, now not only you know do we need to promote ourselves, but I think galleries are expecting us to do a lot of that work for ourselves as well. So the I think the question is, how can we use social media to I, – I've been thinking for a while that social media could be much more effectively used, where the, the gallery – the galleries are there to, to sell the work, to show what they have. And to work in sync with the artists. So the artist's job is to educate and, and to tell the world who they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that might, be, that might be slightly less braggy, but I agree. I mean, I feel very sorry for, you know, I know, some, you know most, of, most wonderful painters I know, are, you know, they just want to be painting. They do not want to be doing this stuff. And it's, it's tough. Yeah, it is. I think if you can get to the point where you can think of – promoting yourself as telling the stories behind your work as opposed to like standing up on a soapbox and saying I'm so great. Yes. It's the stories that interest people. It's all about the communication and that's what art I think is. It's just a visual storytelling technique. Exactly. Painting and so if you can you know share with people what is behind it and get them excited about it, you don't you're kind of done there, you know. <laughs> like if you can convince if you can yeah, it's like sitting around a fire back in the day and telling people stories to sort of both teach and to entertain. That's right. Yeah, it's a lost art that I think needs to come back and that would help. It's very difficult. I mean, your your work is very painterly too. And, and, and what I'm doing now is starting to fuse painters like Bonnar and that, that influence mid-century, 20th century painting with the narrative work. Mm. And with that work that is so much about the quality of paint, one of the great shame is that it just that does not transcribe well to to Instagram and to social media. It's mm. it doesn't do the painting justice. So that's it's very difficult. Yeah, that's why I suppose the only the best thing to do is is to be able to talk about why one works and you know exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit, well. I at least I'm a big proponent of that that if you can talk about what it is that excites you why you paint what's what got you interested in this in the beginning then you'll be able to get other people will feed off of your excitement and i think it's just 
you know, when two people are having a conversation and one of them gets excited, the other one starts getting excited and you just kind of feed off of each other. And, and it tends to be a much more interesting conversation because you're both excited about it and you're feeding off of each other and you're adding more and more into it. And I think it's the same thing with painting when you're able to tell people why you're so excited about this, what, even if it is, the texture just drives me nuts. And I get so, you know, it's so luscious and beautiful. And Mm -hmm. and when you're able to talk about that, I think you also, people see it and they respond to it and think, oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Jillian, thank you so much for sharing your stories with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be on this podcast. A great honor. Thank you. Thank you again to Julian for sharing his story and insights with us. And I also want to give a shout out to Greg Decker for connecting us. Go to SavvyPainter.com for the show notes on this episode. You can see pictures of Julian's work, links to connect with him, and of course, links to other artists mentioned in this show. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop, so you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.